I can't wait. 21 more freaking days. Actually, 20 days now. Actually, 19. Oh, wait. Hello, folks. I'm the one, the only Hobo Tom. In a full metal solid gear. Cheers. Who's watching this? you like to see what I'm partaking of? Well, what I did partake of. That's something new. You can stick around to see the end of this episode to watch this guy, Hobo Tom, do his normal two-part show where you have cooking with a hobo. But I'll get to that shortly. Now it's time to talk about some full gear. Or full metal gear. Or full solidus. Or whatever. Video game concept they're going to come up with next. This is AEW's Full Gear pay-per-view. Um, it was actually pretty cool. It has some good spots, not so good spots, and a lot of blood, a lot of juice flowing, baby. Yeah, no. Turn that off now. Let's talk about some Full Gear, though. So we start off with the free show. It was B Priestley, Miss Osprey, taking on Britt Baker. Miss Cole. Um, it was an okay match. Uh, I can see why th this is on the pre-show. It was long. I will give AEW some credit, though. Of course, as I'm here wearing my Southern Pro Lucha Libre shirt. Yeah, Southern Pro Lucha Libre. One day coming here to Daytona Beach. Or Ormond Beach. Or Port Orange. Or Deltona. Sometime. But we'll see about that. But that's a whole other different topic. But with Bree Priestley, Bree Priestley versus Britt Baker, it, this actually felt like a pre-show match. Um, it was pretty strong style by both of them, both striking each other. Kind of really basic wrestling moves going on. Um, Bree Priestley, again, known more so for her strikes. Britt Baker... Not really known for anything besides being a dentist and, and the girlfriend of Adam Cole. Hey, hey! Even NXT gets on AEW somehow. Wow. But the neat thing was Taz was a commentary. I know Taz is around Philadelphia. That's only hour, hour and a half away, so that's not too bad for Taz. Yeah, and to show up for half an hour, probably get a good pile of money, get some plugs in. Good for you, Taz. It's good to see, it's good to hear your voice again. Uh, it was a fairly consistent match, though. I mean, it wasn't anything terrible. Whatever issue these two women had in the past, I guess they worked out. This was the shoot that led up to a work. I guess. I mean, if you believe everything that you hear, these two just didn't like each other at one particular time. There was a backstage brawl or shouting match or hair pulling or I don't know. Biatch calling thing, whatever. Whatever women do. Normally, guys just like fight up and say, oh, I'm sorry, let's go have a beer. Or let's have a other type of delicious type of refreshing adult beverage. Hmm. Women, they just like hate each other forever. Guys like punch each other in the face, have a beer, and it's like, whatever. This match again was pretty good. Um, Rip Baker did try to hook in the lockjaw the first time. B Priestley went to pin her. Uh, Britt evaded B Priestley's finisher, whatever I think it was. I forget what it was. I was kind of half cooking. Eventually, uh, Bree's definitely the heel, though. Um, again, doing a lot of again heelish things, using the ropes to her, her advantage, waiting for the whole after the four count. For the ref to say, hey, break it before I get to five. And, and then, of course, right right then and there, she'll actually break the hold. Well, that's funky stuff. I have to clean my keyboard off one day. But I have to, I have to clean the house tomorrow. Not looking forward to that. I'll do this while this, this uploads probably to YouTube. This will probably be up, well, later today, I guess. But I mean, B. Priestley stuffing the heel with Smash Brick Baker's the face. Um, second time, Britt Baker hit and got in the lockjaw. B Priestley tapped pretty quickly. Taz was impressed. 
listen, if they could pay Taz a pile of money, he'd be impressed, so that's okay. So, uh, this match, uh, it was good. I just didn't care. Wow. I didn't care about a wrestling match. That's not good. Therefore, this match gets a ham sandwich. Oh, and I found out what a ham sandwich is the equivalent of. Shoot. I'll have to mention that tomorrow. I should load up. Well, not tomorrow, but I have to find pictures of stuff. Get that stuff. Ready for the, the raw show with spoilers. I forget if they're out there. <laughs> it's been a whole day early. That's terrible. It's evil. Whoa, my CPU usage. I like looking at weird funky numbers. Yeah, just this weird stuff every so often. But actually, I think the higher the number is, the better quality I get. So that's probably good. Um, but then Kong, awesome, awesome Kong, and Brandy Rhodes came out. And Kong produced this like knife that I have in my block and cut off a lock of B. Priestley's hair. Is that a trophy? Is that voodoo magic? It would be something different for Awesome Kong. I just don't know what it would be. And if they did this to Brit, would she yank out teeth? That's weird. But then they get to the main show. And let's see here. Who do I have winning this match? I even have this here. Smackdown. I have to look at my notes. Oh, I had Bit Breaker winning. Yay. Oh, that was my Stone Cold Lock, too. I got brownie points for that. That's pretty cool. That was my prediction. So I'm now. See, there weren't actually that many matches either. I'm going to scratch the one match. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow. There were eight. One for eight right now. Pretty good. Um, I'll make a judgment on that later. Oh, wow. Yep, got that right. Got that. Oh, wow. I might be like a 50 50 book right thing. We'll see how I do. But going back to AEW, the show starts off proper with Pyro and Steam. And what else was there? There was something else from one of the entrances. And Young Buck Dollars. Uh, my one thing about this entire show is that it was really weird in the fact that it had a weird match order. Now I kind of understand it, but at the moment you're like, this match is first? Wait, where's this match? And then they switch one match. I know cards are always subject to, subject to change, but it's a little annoying. So again, you have Indoor Pyro, Steam, and Young Buck Bucks flying around the place. Um, and there was a ramp that led directly to the ring. I forget. I know they do that it's sometimes in New Japan Pro Wrestling. They don't do that in WWE. They didn't do that when AEW came to Sona. New Japan does it sometimes. I don't think Chikara does it. Nor do I think Ring of Honor does it. Impact does it. Sometimes I think it depends on the arena. So it's something different, something nice to see. So we start off with the Young Bucks versus the uh, Pride and Powerful or, or Pride and something. Proud and Proud and Prideful, I don't know. I forget. LAX or X LAX. Ortiz and Santana. Um start off, of course, 
from Season of Santana. Because we see that the Rock and Roll Express is there. Um, it's a cheap shot, again, to start the match. Then they start to brawl. And also, when they get outside the ring, the Rock and Roll Express is at ringside. And they get taunted by Ortiz and Santana. Um, out, outside, again, it calms down. And then it becomes your wrestling match. Uh, Nick Jackson at one point went over the top of Matt Jackson. I do love it when they do those double team moves where you tag the guy in and they get that extra shot in. Um, Matt had Santana's, I think, arm extended or something extended. Yeah, arm extended. So Nick Jackson came over the top of him onto the arm. Again, that little lick to get in. Again, classic NWA tag team stuff, or somewhat classic stuff. It's 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 a modern twist on what they used to do in the old NWA, AWA, WCW, World Class Champ. Yeah, WCCW. A little bit in WCW every so often. An old school WWF. So it's always nice to see that. Uh, then there was uh, the, the super kick, which is always fun to watch. Uh, LAX, again, they're also a they good tag team. Do the same thing, except for it's to, I think, Matt Jackson's leg, where uh, Matt Jackson's legs is extended by Ortiz, and Santana kind of stomps on it. Again, overall, the tag team wrestling in AEW is amazing. Women's division, <laughs> singles division, it's it's good. It's better than average. Well, it's, it's, it's better than average. The tag team division, though, that's the best. Uh, then there's... And eventually the Young Bucks get their comeback. Or, or Tina. Again, clo clothesline the leg. The injured leg that he previously injured. So it's always good to see continuity in wrestling matches. It's important. Um... Young Bucks do get tossed into the Rock and Roll Express. Rock and Roll Express, of course, gets upset about that. Uh, again, there's the Locomotion Northern Lights suplexes by Matt Jackson or Nick or w one of the Young Bucks. Then it turns to a 2X Locomotion where the one Jackson had both members of LAX and the Northern Lights suplex of that. Yeah, this is now bordering on spot fest time. And you know there's always a spot fest time whenever you involve the... There we go, that sounds better. With the Young Buck. Um, again, they did the Risky Business. It's pretty cool. Um, Ortiz, Ortiz suffered a wardrobe malfunction. He showed his, he showed his underwear covered ass to everyone. Because he broke his coveralls somehow. And he's been like... The last quarter of the match, trying to figure out how to fix those coveralls, which was New York team. I don't know if they were doing that. They were pinstriped. It looked like New York almost. I think one of them is from Yonkers. I know they had the Staten Island area code on it. And maybe the Yonkers area code on the other one. Or I think Brooklyn. I think. I'm not too sure. I forget what the three is something is. No, 787 is Staten Island. Only because I lived in Staten Island for two years. So that's the only reason I know. Uh, what else was there? Um, or, or tease. And then, and then they tease the Gringo Killer once. And then the Young Bucks actually hit the Gringo Killer on one half of Ortiz. However, in AEW, you cannot beat someone with their own finisher. So eventually, they do get the Gringo Killer on the Young Bucks. Ortiz and Santana win. Check one off in the box for the circle. And then, as they celebrate, they beat the Young Bucks. A Rock and Roll Express coming to make the save. save. And uh, tag team wrestling, I cannot say anything bad about it, no matter what happens. So with this, again, even though Santana and Ortiz won, another check in that box, this was actually a really fun match. It's a 
a good surf and turf match. And then we get to Pac and Hangman Adam Page. And there's a sign there. Simon give that gives that the up arrow. Yeah. Gives Yeah, that and up. Up arrow. Uh Page for the most part gets beat up by Pac. Pac just tosses him around the outside. Pac's really the more aggress aggressive of the two. Um Page again shows his strength. He does the deadlift pump handle slam. Again, Eventually, Paige eats the heel of the heel of Bastard Pac. His Bastard Pac is best Pac. I guess they came to an agreeable way Pac would lose. Pac, for a weird thing, really slowed down the pace a lot. And it seemed to be more... You would think slowing down the pace would be an Hagman, Hagman Page's advantage. But Pac, again, he does the really heel thing. It became less old Pac, too, for a while. Uh, oh, until Pac hit that brain buster on the chair. Oh, brain busters are so good to see. And the referee kind of had a slow 10 count. And it's like, yeah. It's like, really? It's like, he'd, he'd, he'd jump up. One. Get off the turnbuckle. Take like three steps back. Jump on the turnbuckle. Two. Do that to like the nine count, and you're like, this is slow. I think even JR noticed. It's like, this is a really slow count. It's like, listen, Pac wants to count on victory. Hey, a win is a win, right? Uh, with that, it also became a New Japan Pro Wrestling style backbreaker match. He who gets dropped on their back the least wins. Because they just started to drop each other in the back. Um, and uh, Pac went for the Yano. Indeed. In fact, we saw a couple of Yano moments in this card, which means those young bucks learned something from their time in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and they decided to steal some of it. Boo, young bucks. Boo, stealing stuff. Especially from Yano. Y-T-R. Break, break, break. But Pac tried to do the reverse nut kick by distracting the referee. Again, the Yano. But this time, Adam Hag and Adam Page was smart enough. He realized he caught that. Hit the butt shot lariat. Did the dead eye to poor Pac. Pac lost, and Hangman Adam Page won. I'll tell you what. It was a good match. It was a, it was a good, it was fairly good entertaining match. The crowd just was not involved with this match whatsoever, though. And the crowd's not getting involved. You know, I'm not getting involved. This is a cheeseburger of a match. And actually, I think I got that one wrong. In my notes. Who did I have winning? Yeah, I had Pac winning. And then it got weird because it was they 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 they, they pulled a switch Rooney on me instead of having what was it Darby Allen versus Jack Hagar? Because Hagar would just kick him in the nuts. They had Sean Spears versus Joey Janela. Eh, okay, so I'll just say whoever the heel was, if the heel wins, um, Sean Spears is definitely the heel. Joey Janela is the face. So for because I actually did get my Stone Cold locked down. I'll say whoever's the heel. So who did I choose? So oh, I chose the heel to win. So wow. I shall give myself a point for that. So I'm now three out of eight. Out of four matches so far. I mean, maybe I'm better than 50-50. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, Sean, uh, Joey Janela just jumps Spears. He's tired of him. Joey Janela comes out. I didn't realize he's from Asbury Park, New Jersey. Same town as Bam Bam Bigelow was always built from. Interesting fact. Um, I do like Joey Janela's theme. I do like the fact it's very Miami Vice-ish. Anything from the late 80s, early 90s, this guy is a fan of. Uh, so Joey Janela jumps spears. Then they have an exchange of chops. Woo! Um, 
There was some outside wrestling. <laughs> that was the one great spot. Neither, neither are really great wrestlers, but all the antics they did were really good. Uh, Sean Spears takes off the turnbuckle bolt wrapping where, you, where referees typically stick the tag rope for non-tag matches. Uh, so he took that covering off, exposed the turnbuckle bolt itself, and also exposed the tag rope, and he tied Joey Janelle's hair to, to the tag rope. That started to work on him, and every time Joey Janelle, I think one time Joey Janelle tried to pull away, he got yanked back because his hair was tied there. So that was pretty cool. And very yawning. Indeed. I might have to adjust for all the stuff they did. Um, what else was there? Now I want to know how Joey Janela wrestles with a nose ring. I have never understood how wrestlers, and he's not the only one. This is probably my one pet peeve about pro wrestling. Is that somehow they managed to wrestle with nose rings, lip piercings, snake bite piercings, and ear, ear piercings. If I wanted to be just a jackass heel, I would just grab that nose ring and yank it right off. I, I, it, would just, it would be terrible of me, but I'll tell you what, it would probably get so many boos, and I'd be like, dude, I had to do I, I could always say, I had to do something to get heat, man. And the guy would probably be, yeah, cool, whatever. Yeah, I've never understood that, though, how wrestlers can wrestle with those piercings. I think there was one Vale Tude fight I saw in a friend's collection, and this came out right around when UFC won three. The first couple UFC fights were, it was actually like the two guys getting an occasion fight forever, sometimes, like 10, 20 minutes before they actually organized it. It's a volley tudo thing in Brazil. And like the one guy was showing off his earring, the other guy just chicken grab like ripped it right out of his ear. Oh, that's the heel thing to do. I mean if Sean Spears really wanted to be a dick, he'd do that. Uh, again, Sean Spears says the other heel thing he calls for the timeout. Yeah. Um What else was there? There was the the backdrop. Oh, yeah, the backdrop on the ring apron was pretty cool. And then, and then what happened is that they pulled another Yano. And this kind of got me, and I'm just like, no, I've seen Yano's. Without Yano's twice, this, this, is, this is no good. You cannot steal from Toro Yano. Boo, Sean Spears. There are reasons why WWE kicked you out. There's reasons why Impact kicked you out. Oh no, that no, that was Austin Aries. That's that's for other reasons. But so what Sean Spears did, he went to undo the top turnbuckle pad, threw the turnbuckle pad on the ground. So when he did that, of course, referee says, "No, you can't do that. What are you doing?" He's like, "Hey, it fell off." So of course, being good referee, he he takes turnbuckle pad and and attaches the turnbuckle. Meanwhile, he throws Joey Janela outside the ring. Um, Tully Blanchard <laughs> It's an outside the ring Between Tully Blanchard and Sean Spears It was an outside the ring Meltzer driver And then uh, Sean Spears throws him Throws Joey Janela back Now then one aspect That was not so good Is that they did a Kip Saban interview Which was okay And then they introduced Penelope Ford So they're Having more women wrestle for them who don't really wrestle good. I don't know. You know what happens when I hear when I know that? Time to drink. Then we had our tag team match, ta uh, tag team three way. Private Party versus Lucha Brothers versus SoCal Uncensored. Uh, Kazarian and Isaiah, I think, started off. JR 
doesn't like tag team wrestling. I mean, doesn't like fun tag team wrestling. And for this match, everyone started off in a brawl. Uh, then the, the, then the, the Lucha Brothers did the uno, dos, tres, super kick to someone. The, the Lucha Brothers should be tag team champions of everything. I what people say. The thing with this match... Oh yeah, the previous match was a ham sandwich. So getting into this, um, like in the tag team match, and I'll have to find a creative way to edit that. But again, they did the Uno dos Tres super kick. It wasn't smooth. It was weird because they did like especially Pentagon. He seemed to be a step off, which I think made Phoenix the office. Whenever Phoenix did anything individually, Phoenix. Ray Phoenix, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Whenever they had to do something with Pentagon and someone else, I don't know if it was the other person, that they just didn't really flow smoothly. It was kind of a clunky match. Although it did take time, I guess, because eventually it did get smoother out, with, with one exception, and I'll get to that. Because uh, this is going to be bad for, for this particular person soon. Private Party again, they, they do have those creative double team moves. Uh, the chain wrestling they do is amazing. Like, whoa, I didn't know you could really do I thought only the Lucha Brothers could do that stuff. I guess Private Party can too. Uh, they, got, they got the ref eventually to do the Cerro Miedo too, which is always fun. I always love it when the ref gets involved. I think they had to like burn some time. Frankie Kazarian has to be careful though. He has to stop those pullover hurricanas. Because one day he's going to break his own neck. This was the second time. The first time that happened was in their match for the tag team titles. That was two dynamites ago. Maybe it's just recent memory where I'm like, ooh, wait, didn't he do that out before? But he needs to stop doing that because he's going to really hurt himself. I've dislocated his shoulder twice. It sucks. It's not the most, it's not the injury that's going to out you. It's going to screw up your shoulder. So every so often I can still hear it popping it out. And it's just going to shorten your career by a couple of years and or really limit what you're going to do. Like, I know when I go fishing, the shoulder hurts. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's age. Father time always wins. Old injuries always win, too. And once you injure something, it's never 100%. might be 99%. But that 1% makes a world of difference sometimes. So you have to be careful, though. I love what Jared calls move. He's like the boom, the boom, bang, flip. He went, Ray Phoenix somehow went from the one side of the ropes, boom, to the corner, bang, to the other ropes, and did his flip onto everyone. Ray Phoenix again, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Uh, Private Party hit the shooting star press. However, that's not the finisher, though. Um, SCU eventually hit their... Uh, SC, whatever they call it. And SCU retained their belt in a good cheeseburger match. I mean... It was clunky, but still, the stuff they did was amazing. The Lucha Brothers were upset because remember, the Lucha Brothers didn't get pinned. The SEU uh, pinned someone from Pri Private Party. Lucha Brothers had no chance. So they were upset. They started to beat up um, Scorpio Sky and Frankie Gazarian. And all of a sudden, lights go out. And then there's two Pentagon Juniors in the ring, and they're mirroring each other. You can tell the one would do this, so the one would obviously do that. 
he he'd go up, he'd be like, and he'd stare at the guy. It's like another guy again, like that. So and Cero Miedo and Ray Phoenix, I think, just like got in the ring and just said, "What you y- you?" And then the one Pentagon Junior beat up the other Pentagon Junior. You could kind of tell. Only because of the lack of arm tattoos. Who is who? But Christopher Daniels, the fallen angel, returns and beats up both Lucha brothers. And this begs the question Will SEU Freebird the AEW champion? That would be interesting to see. And again, this was a fun match. It was a good cheeseburger match. Uh, and then we move on to Emi Sakura versus Riho. Actually, oh, who do I know? Because I had uh, Lucha Brothers winning. I guess this is probably more so the way it does protect the Lucha Brothers more. But then we had Emi Sakura versus Rio for that woman's belt. Emi Sakura does nothing for me. Rio does nothing for me. They start off with a test of strength, which is ridiculous. Rio is a 98 pound, listen, five foot tall schoolgirl. I hate saying that. Sounds so bad, but Jim Cornette is right. Riho's a 98-pound, 5-foot schoolgirl. Emi Sakura, pretty good. I like the stuff she does. She's not championship material. Again, this is where AEW really... Uh, they did the test of strength. I, I think my cat's stronger than Riho. My cat pounced, pounced on Riho. Riho would be knocked back three feet. Right now, my cat's down there taking her, her nap. Every so often, she just looks up at me. Hmm? Why is he asleep yet? Because I'm actually getting to be my bedtime soon. Because I have to let the video process overnight and then load this up <laughs> whenever I so bring up tomorrow or later. But, again, the test of strength doesn't make sense. Riho should never initiate that. She's just going to get crushed. I mean, one thing if Emi Sakura did that, just say, come on, let's have some fun. I'll use one hand and you can use two. At least give give Rio a chance. Because her name is Rio and she dances on the stage. Oh, oh, wait, that's Rio, not Rio. That's a good song versus some schoolgirl wrestler. Uh, so then Rio got cross body when she was on the outside by. A- by, by Sakura. That looked great. Um, that was a kick out. With two a single leg crab, which I'm impressed with. And I didn't realize that they teach a single leg crab over there in Japan as a basic moveset. Excalibur, in this match, Excalibur was really trying to put over the women. Jair was just burying them. And anytime Jair could, could take a dig at Alabama because Alabama lost in their football game. Against LSU, he took his digs. He's like, "Oh, what's that? What's that move called?" And you can almost, you can, This is the mental image. It's like, "Oh, what's that move called?" Excalibur, don't you know the name of that move? Excalibur's probably looking at me like, "You really want me to say it?" And Jerry's like, "Yeah." <laughs> so, so what do you mean you don't know what that move is? That's the Alabama slam. I'm gonna punch you later. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put too much barbecue sauce on your steak. I'm going to water down your beer or something. I don't know. Make me say stupid stuff like that. Because Tony Schiavone, I guess, works for University of Georgia and has to go media his games. Again, they probably pay a lot more consistently than AEW has. He probably does have a much longer contract with them, too. Getting back to this match again, Excalibur puts over the women. There just buries them. Amy Sakura does that amazing rolling Mexican surfboard. Oh, that's so good. And I'll tell you what. The Japanese Japanese women, they figured out they have the they know how to give the best expressions ever. It was when people were booing her for whatever she did. She'd be like, Ooh. it just looks so genuine. It looked like she was enjoying herself. Uh she did she did the Vader stomp. To Riho and also did a reverse Vader bomb. Oh, that oh, that was awesome. 
But yeah, it's something new, something different. They trade forearms and chops. No, Riho should never trade chops or forearms with anyone. Again, if my cat pounced on Riho, Riho would be launched back three feet. Shoot wise. If I gave Riho a chop, it would knock her back six feet. Shoot wise. If Riho chopped this guy, I'd be like. <laughs> And then my cat would probably claw my eyes out. Uh, Riho. Again. She is the master of stomps. I'll give her that. Master of stomps and meteor and double knees. Uh, so that was eventually enough. To, uh, stomping, doing enough stomps and double knees to Emmy Sakura. Where Riho wins. I'll tell you what, though. I, I hate to say it, but I agree with Cornette. Rio, the only reason why Rio's there is because she's she's buddies with, with um wait where's my notes oh what's that is that she, is that she <laughs> she wrestled Kenny and like oh they didn't mention that um they did mention her first wrestling match when she was twelve years old they did not say who was it against but it was at Sakura Hall in Japan wait a second what did I, what did I do with that page oh was it pre that it was, that's why. But they did kind of reference that, and, and Dare seemed so unimpressed. Calibers is full of knowledge. That puts me at four out of eight matches, so I'm already a 50 50 booker. That's pretty cool. In fact, there's only two matches left. Indeed. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, there are only two matches left. Let's see here. So actually, I got five out of eight right. And it's going to be 5.5. So that was the match of the night. So wait a second. I might as well have gotten a six. Six and a half, because I actually called all the right stuff. That's good. So, so if Stephanie McMahon was in charge, I was in Stephanie McMahon's head. I'll put that graphic up later. But then we had Cody Rhodes versus Chris Jericho. And they said that there were three judges there and said this match has a 60 minute time limit. If it goes past 60 minutes, the judges have control. Boo. I, I need more drink. Ice. Ice is good. That is really cool. They have Dean Malenko. I didn't realize he was like, oh, by WWE. Then they had Arn Anderson, who I know that we know WWE. <laughs> he like, uh, because, because, because of, um, uh, Fox. Uh, Alicia Fox. And they had the great mood of there. Those are three actually pretty good judges. They said 60 minutes. I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be a 60 minute long match. I'm going to lay on the couch and take a nap. Um, starts off really as a very traditional mat wrestling match. A lot of arm arm drags, arm bars, uh, wrist locks, hammer locks, uh, standing switches. I was shocked at that. Uh, then Cody Rhodes goes after Jericho's arms a lot. And, oh, the spot of the day. Cody Rhodes from flying. I don't know if he did it intentionally. Or if he was hoping it would happen, or if it just happened, he busted himself up. Thus, the road, the American dream was looking down upon my boy. My boy, his forehead's too smooth. He needs to get some scars there. He needs to bleed a little bit. He's too pretty looking for that pretty looking wife of his brandy. He needs to get ugly like the old man did. Yeah. And you know what that means, because he is announced as a grandson. Of a plumber, and I ain't ever seen no plumber with a forehead as smooth and as youthful looking as that. So he had to bleed. He he did it the hard way. He 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 did hit his head funky. It was probably planned that way, even though I didn't think he wanted to to bleed like that. But yeah, because then 
Chris Jericho worked over his head. And the other thing is, both were wearing wheat belts. So you know that's going to come into effect sooner or later. Um, there was a very deliberate slow place, so slow pace by Jericho. It makes sense. He's a heel. Jericho's kind of losing his shape. Oh! Happy birthday, Chris Jericho! You're only six years older than me. Is that good or bad? I don't know. Um, ooh, again, Jericho would kind of go after that one spot on Cody Rhodes. It was, it was really good. Uh, then again, it was, it was kind of reversal city there for a while. Oh, uh, Jericho goes outside because Cody's beat up. He gets in Cody's mom's face. <laughs> Mrs. Rose just slapped the taste out of Chris Jericho. <laughs> Chris Jericho seemed to like it. And, oh, Cody gave his mom a hug. Let's all just get along and hug it out. Hug it out. Uh, back in the ring, Cody went for the figure four. Eventually, Jericho does reverse the pressure. Um, Hagar, he, uh, Hagar gets involved. Referee Aubrey says, that's enough of you. You're out of here. He gets tossed. Uh, MJF acts as... And he, he's so happy. He's like, na, 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 na. Na, 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 na. Hey, goodbye. Na 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 na. Hey, goodbye. Uh, so MJF is there again. That's acts as a little bit of a distraction to Jericho. And there's shades of Eddie Guerrero coming there. Let's go, Eddie. Eddie's still with us, baby. Um. Because Jericho took the belt, whacked Cody over the head with it, and reopened that cut again. Uh, tossed the belts out and just laid there. Hey, if it goes to a 10 count, he retains the championship. But I wonder if Cody didn't lose, but I don't know. That would that'd be interesting. It would be different. Um, Cody eventually gets up. Again, the Judas effects are counter to the crossroads. And of course, Cody Rhodes hit the bionic elbow. Oh, my boy, my sweet. A sweet busted open boy. Yeah! You make your papa proud and your grandpappy prouder. Because you're the grandson of a plumber, baby. Uh, then, eventually, Jericho did counter some, did counter the crossroads with the code breaker. And then Chris Jericho takes off his weight belt, starts to whip Cody with his weight belt. It's normally Cody does, does that. Then it was the Boston Crab first, and then Oh my gosh. That was the most gruesome looking, horrific, pain inducing lion tamer ever. Because he had him up in the lion tamer, which is almost like the Boston Crab. The Boston Crab, you took the guy and just sit on him. Lion tamer, he kind of propped the guy up a little bit right on his neck. And he put his shin right across the back of Cody's neck and just began to rub it in. Oh, yeah. And MJF tossed in the towel. You did not see that finish happening. And MJF then turns on Cody Rhodes. Again, people didn't like MJF. MJF's proper heel. Uh, some fan actually threw like, some garbage at MJF. You see, he got wet. And you know that was shoot because that security guy was right there, and there were two other guys right behind him coming. He's like, "You, you're out of here." This was fun. Uh, Chris Jericho retains his belt, and I got this one wrong. I said Cody was going to win, cause some friction between him and Kenny, but Cody is no longer going to be wrestling for the belt due to NJF's interference. The Sewell still was a very good surf and turf match. And then the lights came back on and there was one more match. I was kind of terrified because this took us till about 11 o'clock. 11, I think it was 10 40 something. 
And I'm like, they're not going to show the unsanctioned match to, to the pay-per-view people or the people that get through, through, through YouTube. But they did, and I was like, for a second there, I'm like, oh, wow, they're not going to show this match. It's going to be like a dark match. Boo! Then my other fear was like, this match is going to be 13 minutes long. This match is going to suck. However, it wasn't. Thankfully, it wasn't. So we had the cleaner Kenny Omega taking on John Moxley. This just starts off as a brawl. It's an unsanctioned match. This match was utterly amazing. There were headshots, chair, so chair shots, chair shots in the crowd, fighting in the crowd, beer can shots, a real garbage can was used. Not the El Cheapo aluminum one that folds up any with any ding. Yes, if you're old like me, you remember those. You did not want to hit those garbage cans because there would be a dent and you could never get that dent out of the garbage can. It was probably the most ridiculous garbage can ever created until they found out how to make rubberized garbage cans. The plastic ones, because with the original... The original steel garbage cans, way back in the day, even for this guy, if you hit, if you bumped into those to your car, you put a little dent in the garbage can, a big dent in the car. So I guess trash companies switched. So they switched to aluminum garbage cans. However, you hit that with your car, you got a yeah, scratch on your car, half the garbage can caves in. Then they went plastic garbage cans which were a little bit better but the problem is you hit it with your car nothing happened to your car it wrecked your garbage can and then they went to finally like the new modern kind of hard rubber garbage cans where it just bounces off everything so again that's the evolution of garbage cans um, after people just threw trash out windows and let raccoons eat it but again, you have... But they used a real garbage can. It was a real plastic garbage can. And you know, it was one of the real real plastic garbage cans that you'll find in arenas all across the world. And especially outside here in Florida because they just, for some reason, hold up a lot better with the weather. They don't, they don't rust. Rubber garbage cans do dry out. I remember when my garbage can that the city provided at one time was kind of nice and rubbery and flexible. It gets in weather ice and it just gets beat up. There's cracks all over the, the lid now and it's just ugly. It's, it's it's an old garbage can. But they took the one garbage can that had an actual garbage garbage and garbage juice. And you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever had to go into your garbage can or especially if you leave your garbage can outside or in any arena where people throw like fluids in, well mainly unfinished beverages and for some reason they always come on the cup and you get that like garbage juice at the bag and you're like Ew. it's like the one thing you don't want to touch is the garbage juice it's not all the garbage isn't that bad it's the garbage juice which is the funky stuff <laughs> those are real garbage cans with real garbage and garbage juice Beers, beer cans were used the destruction of beer cans you're 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 wasting good adult beverage though. Especially if you had to pay like nine bucks for that. I don't care what wrestler wanted to use my beer. I paid nine bucks for a cup of for for a can of beer. I'm drinking that beer. I don't care how much fame I get. That's that's a pile of money. Or unless Kenny Omega slips me like. At the twenty buck bill and say, "Here, I need your beer. Here's a twenty. I'll be like, take beer. This is worth two beers." Yeah, which kind of scary. Um, then they, then of course, John Moxley found the barbell bar baseball bat and started to be very creative. He started to whack Kenny over the back with it, um, his stomach, and he would use it to get out of holds by by raking it across his arms, which that has to hurt. Kenny would then get up by using the garbage can lid and just start whacking John Moxley over the head with it. Um, there was the use of the barbed wire broom. A table was out. 
And most strap forward, they pulled out all the old CZW tricks. CZW, CZW. It was that weird cross between a CZW match and a Japanese death match for like American audiences. It was actually pretty fun. A brass plate anchor chain was used. Uh, and Kenny did eat the mouse trap board. The anchor chain was used um, by both by both wrestlers on both wrestlers. John Moxley initially used it to kind of pull back the teeth like um, Rusev did once on Roman Reigns. And then Kenny tried to kill John Moxley by hanging him with that brass chain. And eventually you can see John Moxley like like fading. It's like, Ref, he can't breathe. It was so fun to hear some of the people in the crowd just shout. Those they were wired. Those not so much the ring, but right outside the ring, those cameras caught everything the ringside people said. And then uh Kenny Omega uh produces a bag of glass. Which was supposed to be glass, I think, from the table that he went through. Smashes that up. He teases, of course, cutting John Moxley over the head with it. Uh, could not do that. He takes, so he just kicks him, smashes it, pours it on the ring, uh, drops John Moxley on it back first. I think it was the power bomb that did it. Uh, goes to pin him, and he <laughs> even in this match, the ref lead because the ref is going one. To, oh, shoot! Sure, he, he, he cut himself on that glass. I'm sure most of it was sugar glass because that's just insane. Um, Mox, Mox, <laughs> Mox crawls through the glass to get to ropes. Uh, he finds a screwdriver. He tries to. Again, this is just who's going to kill who first. This is just witnessing murder, folks. Because he did somewhat imitate the spot that uh, Suzuki tried to stab Ju um, uh, whatever Liger. With a pick, and the pick actually went through the table because Liger, because Liger moved. In this instant, Moxie was going to stab Kenny Omega in the head, and instead he winds up stabbing the turnbuckle. And it would have been interesting to see how that would have played out if they used that turnbuckle again. Uh, then they start. Then they have a barbed wire mattress on the outside. Kenny like made that somehow from garb. Bitch, he found in Baltimore. You people in Baltimore are freaks. Because there was a barbed wire mattress or trampoline. Uh, eventually, John Moxley's not that bright because he suplexed Kenny Omega into that. But if you do a suplex, that means you go through that too. They literally had like 10 people trying to get him out. Uh, Moxley like clocked some guy trying to help him. He just like punched him in the head. Then, the, then Kenny Omega V triggers Moxley through the stage, the stage light, and use another stage light to like smack, smack Moxley in the back in the head with. Mox comes out covered in, in, in buck bucks. Mox is so happy. He's like, I finally got to do what I did. Eventually, they uh, Mox goes destroys the ring. Takes the canvas off, takes the cushy pad off, closes the boards. Um, they kind of fight f to see who gets to drop who on the boards. John Moxley hits the paradigm shift on Kenny Omega on the boards, and that gives me my extra point. So I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, because I got five. And I got my bonus, so I'm happy. John Moxley won. Renee, John Moxley's going to need some loving tonight. Just be gentle, Renee. Be gentle. And again, this match was really fun. I'll tell you what, I'm going to upgrade this match only because I enjoyed it so much. It, it felt like a death match without people bleeding all over the place on each other, on the fans. The fans, for the most part, were relatively safe. There was blood, but I think the worst was when John Moxley got hit in the back of the head. I think he actually like tore something because, like, for a while he was like pouring blood. My fear was that he cut something on his neck. That's not good. So yeah, that was the only thing that, that everything else 
you know, if you got hit with real barbed wire, you'd just be busted open all over the place. So, you know, it's a somewhat gimmick. But that one spot, Moxie took like the back of his neck. That's not pretty. When you see blood like literally dripping out of the back of your neck, that's something to be terrified of. But that was the only thing. And, and actually, once that closed up naturally, it was like, eh. Probably like just really did it. Got a couple of capillaries at the wrong spot. Or a minor vein, or I'm sure something's back there, but it wasn't anything like it wasn't spurting out at least. So I'll tell you what, this is a flaming yawn match. Ooh, yeah, you say, baby. So overall, full gear was a fun pay per view. AEW still has to improve on some things. Overall, I'll say this was a cheeseburger of a show. And that was that. Um, the next pay-per-view I'm going to be reviewing is probably going to be SummerSlam. Oh, a couple news and notes about next week. I'm kind of happy. I'm kind of happy I get to go see an NXT match. Um, Monday, I'll be doing my normal show. It'll be the Raw Review show. I'll actually get that up Monday, too. I don't have to work at night yet. Uh, Tuesday, I'll be doing my normal Impact show. Wednesday will be AEW. We'll see how that goes. Because I know Impact does really weird post-recap shows, and they're just not fun to watch. Friday is going to be Friday Night Smackdown. I'll review up for that. And then Saturday, I get to go to NXT again. So Saturday, you can see this guy, Hobo Tom, here in Daytona Beach, live. Again, if you want your shout-out, say hi to a bunch of people on my channel, which I'd be most appreciative of. I'll be there live, and you can always say hey to me. I'll say, hi, Chad. I miss you. I hate my job. Well, actually, I do like my job. But I'd rather be at wrestling matches talking with her about wrestling and talk life stuff and stare at her legs. And Oh, I'm being too far ahead of my But that was AEW. Again, fairly good quality of programming. However, there's a bonus episode to this. Stay tuned for some Cooking with Hobos. And you too can somewhat learn how to make triple crunch, triple decker crunch wraps. Because I tried. Somewhat successful. You'll see what I mean by that. I had to finagle things a little bit. Still, overall, really darn good. Welcome again, folks. Another amazing cooking with the hobo. Cooking show. My name is the one, the only. I am Ho Bo Tom. Oops, sorry for that weird pause. Kind of my phone went off and I wanted to see who it was. So today, in honor of Full gear. What you see here, well, there's a pan. Actually, let me go get supplies up. Here I have tostadas, chips, burrito shells, cheese, meat, or actually salsa. Let's see here. Got the camera there for a moment. So I have that. Yep, my sink's a mess. Shredded lettuce. Very important. Sour cream, again, fairly important. Yummy pico de gallo. You always have to have beef somewhere. And then finally, some Fiesta Blend shredded cheese. So what does that mean, folks? It means today we're making, I have the oven all set up. 
means that we are making some a staple from turn that on a little bit warm that up staple from Taco Bell and the fat oh that's right clean these finally I make I'm going to be making some homemade triple decker crunch wraps in order to watch on NXT so the first thing that has to be done is take my beef have to brown the beef put in the pan yeah always dispose of things you're gonna hear the water running because when you're dealing with raw food, you always have to you know, wash your hands. So let's see, I have a towel over here. I'm gonna let that cook, and also what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna season it a little bit. <coughs> I'm gonna put the salsa in. Garlic. Some red chili flake. I'm not going to season up too much, because one, garlic powder is pretty pound stuff. It has some basic Italian, Italian seasoning. <laughs> Spaghetti! Then the infamous season all. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to let this brown off a little bit. I'm going to break this up. I have my spoon that I actually just washed. So I'm just going to kind of break this up pretty easily here. See that you don't need to see me that much. Then I'm just trying to break this up a little bit. I want to brown off as well as it's very bad to eat raw stuff. And especially in the fact that because huh, I am a hobo I kind of bought this when I could and I'm saving it for a moment just like this. Really, this is only, well, some of the cooking part. I'll show you the little trick that I've kind of learned. A little bit, but for the most part, I'm going to keep on using that spoon. I'm actually going to put the lid on to let it brown off a little bit quicker. And so right now, as you can see, kind of somewhat minced. I have it set to seven. I do not necessarily want to burn the heck out of it, put the lid on, and we'll come back probably in a few minutes because I know AEW Full Gear is going to come on, at least the pre-show, and and while wow, I'm looking forward to that pre-show of, of Britt Breaker and Britt Priestley, that's going to be terrible. So again, I have that cooking off, I shall, so I shall return once that sun's cooking off, and show you how I put together my triple wrap crunch wraps and how I make them kind of stick together. I'll be back. Bye. I'm going to lower the oven. Okay, now that we're back, I'm going to lower the oven a little bit. See the beef is brown. What I'm going to do next, and this is a little bit up to you. Generally, I like to use hot sauce, salt, hot sauce, so I couldn't find any. So you just have some medium sauce. But I like the fact that it's chunky. And with this, I'm wearing a white shirt, so I really don't want to get this stuff on me. To make it that kind of seasoned beef, again, you can tell kind of broken it up into nice kind of smaller or scoopable chunks. All the meat's brown, so the meat's actually already cooked. I'm just going to break it up just a little bit more. And I see no pinkness, which is good. Pink is bad, especially on a flat top, because that means it's not cooked all the way. On a grill, you can kind of get away with it being pink a little bit more. So what I'm going to do, take the salsa. This is going to give it, again, a little bit more taste and flavor. And I'm using a medium salsa. If you want to use just regular salsa or hot salsa, that's fine. And so what I want to do, I just want to kind of incorporate it in there. And only because it has all that, those good spices in there. And then I'm actually going to start and prep you on how to start to build your crunch wrap and I'm not going to cover this because with this, remember, with the salsa it's actually a lot of liquids and I kind of have to wash the time a little bit so you actually want that salsa to boil off so it's nice, ooh there was a little spark there 
Again, make sure all the meat's thoroughly incorporated with all those yummy, delicious spices. I'll show you what I mean. See how it says it looks perfectly seasoned. So now the next thing we're going to do that we're going to start to build a little bit our tostada. Again, I like to have sour cream on. That's why I have the sour cream out. So again, Odie starts off, I like to use burrito shells. If you have a favorite burrito shell you can use, feel free to use it. Again, I'm being a little brave because I'm wearing a white shirt cooking with a bunch of red stuff. So what I like to do always is that I like to really just to soften up said burrito shell. Goes in the microwave literally for about 10 seconds. Not, not even that, I just said for a minute, I'll stop eventually. Again, while I'm doing that, I'm going to kind of stir. Again, I don't want that much liquid remaining. I want to reduce, yes, cooking more today, I want to reduce as much of the salsa liquid as I can. Well, that's been well over that. Stop. That's a little bit more pliable. And here we go, just for some purpose of the station. Here are tostada shells. Um, you can make these yourself. Again, you can see that I still have the meat kind of cooking off. Again, you open up the tostada shells. And oh, there we go. Take one. Hopefully it's all. Wow, that's actually pretty well intact. This is going to be interesting because I thought these breeder shells were going to be a bit bigger. Why do they seem so freaking huge? But that's okay because we're going to kind of build things. So what I'm going to do, again, I have everything kind of boiling off a little bit. I'm going to kind of take a little chunk. I'm going to let this keep on reducing too. Put spoon away. Bring on another spoon. And I'm going to be into the layer, the different layers of my crunch wrap. And I'll show you what the final product is going to look like. So again, the first layer, and just, I always use a kind of clean spoon. Nice little chunk. And break it up a little bit. It's very flat. You do want to fill in this whole shell. Yeah, just leave a little bit around the edges, but again, you want one fairly substantial. Just break it up a little bit. Put that on the spoon rest. And because that's just going, I'm going to actually set that really to the heat of three. So with now, get your cheese product, and I have a couple minutes. I think most of my spoons are in the dishwasher still. And so you have some nice salsa con queso on top. So you always keep the hot with the hot for the most part. Put that a little bit and it's always nice. Keep that there. Build that. Another layer. And on top of that. Here. So hopefully this actually came out somewhat right. Put a little dash of lettuce on there. Again, you want to spray it out. You don't want it super thick. So you have your bed of lettuce there. Worst comes to worst, the good news is tomorrow I'm having omelets. So I can always put in whatever extra I can have. And you have just kind of a Spanish omelet. Or Mexican omelet. I'll be fine. Okay, so you're going to scoop up and tomato, onion mixture, a little jalapeno there. And try and press on as much as you can. And then finally, and this is all to you because remember, you already added one layer of cheese. Again, I'm going to have this tomorrow. I'm going to take that side, take some shredded cheese. Really a pinch or so. Again, you don't want to super pile it on. You'll press it on there. 
three minutes to go. So I'm going to actually get some fun. You put on your final shell. And this is a key. And to fold it up kind of in six spots. Yes, it will break. Tostada shells are not perfect. And the reason why... Yeah, it's not, per it's not perfect. Actually, I think the burrito shells I got were a little too small. That's the best I can do. Remember, I'm not Taco Bell. I don't have, I'm, I don't have an algorithm for everything. But I do for this, I literally just, be very careful, don't get your hands. Or you can have a panini press, put that on for a couple seconds. Does a couple things, it acts as a weight. So I'm going to leave that on really for a few seconds. Try not to let the plastic touch. Remove it, and it actually for the most part stays in place and actually feels a little cooked too. That's how you make it's unfolding. So you have to leave it on a little bit longer than that. That really is, for the most part, and I'm going to leave it on longer, your homemade crunch wrap. Okay, so actually, so that didn't work out that well. So what, you're, what, what you can do instead, again, it's not going to be perfect, but put another burrito shell on top. It's going to fold the edges in. So again, you have this burrito shell. You're going to fold the edges in a little bit here. Use that. Again, using kind of very poor taco wrapping skills. Again, I've never claimed to work at Taco Bell, so it's hard to say that. So it's almost like having a double layer burrito. And actually, what I'm going to do now... Actually, going to turn the oven on just enough. So here you can actually ta -da, flip that over. Ta -da! Wrap that up a little bit more. Get it nice and tight, especially around the corners and edges. Remember, this is homemade stuff, so there's no way it's going to be perfect because I do not have breed, I do not have crunch wrap making machines at my house. So from there, we'll push on, duh. Again, it's not perfect, but it's actually pretty good. You just kind of have to double wrap things. Again, I'm going to have plenty of food for the next, next week at least. And repeat the process. We'll come back, I'll show you what my three look like in a little bit. Bye. Okay, so I'm actually cooking off a little bit because they did not fold up the way I wanted them to. Oh, well, that's what happens in cooking. So here, my some chips. Again, a nice little festive thing. Oops, don't want to put you there. You over. Then presentation. I'll have enough space for three of them because one I'm sending to a friend. Then I have my chips. Let's see here, some of course, nacho cheese sauce or salsa con queso. Uh, so good. Uh, those are good. And while that's cooking, I'm going to celebrate a little bit because it is, again, a rather festive event. It's almost Thanksgiving. So we have Budweiser Light Mug, that was the oven, just went off, so I'm just going to turn that off, turn off the heat. Remember, I have veggies in there, so I don't necessarily want to cook the veggies. I just want to get a nice crisp on the outer shell itself. Now because this is a bigger class, I actually have a specialty ice cube tray. And in the background, you can hear the Brie, Piece, Brie Priestly match going on. Going with my little specialty ice cube tray, my freaking blocks of ice. One. Two. This is an AEW match, so the good news is this match will probably go on for probably half an hour. Probably will be the whole pre show. Three. I put my three monster sized ice cubes in there, I still have one left over. So I kind of pull that out, put that back in the freezer to be used later. Uh, ouch! Sticking to my fingers. Use you later. And what I'm going to have, just to be a little bit festive, a 
with the Bud Light. I know my house is kind of messy. We have some nice little cherry cola going on here. We'll put that back there. We saw that. And because I wanted to do something a little bit different, I have some root beer schnapps. So again, as always, nice, generous portion, especially over the ice. I'm always go a little heavy on this. That's not going to last too long. If I do run out of this, I have Jaeger Meister, so that's fine with me. And then cherry cola on top of that. Always liquor first, then soda on top. So that's going to have actually a nice sweet smell to it. That's pretty, actually making me hungry and thirsty at the same time. So now I have my drink all set. I have my one condiment. Meaning my nacho cheese, which is always delicious. I think that's all I had when I did my first triple A event. But the triple mania! Here, got my glove out. Okay, I know which one my friend's getting, because that's actually the best looking one. I'm gonna grab this, and we right back with that. So I know you can't see it, but it's actually, it came out pretty decent. They unfolded a little bit in the oven. My chips, my crunch wraps, my condiments, my beverage. And I'd like to thank everyone for watching and please like, share, comment, subscribe. It's time to get to some e AEW and watch the shoot fight between Bree Priestley and Britt Baker. Or Miss Osprey versus Miss Cole. Bye! There we go. See, you can actually see the different layers in this triple crunch wrap. Like that, my cheese, that, my drinks. Oh, wrestling! Wrestle, wrestle. Again, thanks everyone for watching. Let me know what this video was. I know they're not the perfect looking thing. I'll tell you what, they are pretty tasty looking. I'll talk to everyone later. Bye.